Uh, thank you. It's a huge pleasure to be with you all today. And you just heard that this ceremony is going to be very long. So I just want to take the time to point out that I do have the advantage of being short. <laughs> so President Botstein, trustees, academic colleagues, parents, friends, and most of all students, thank you for this opportunity to share my thoughts with you on this important day at this exceptional institution. I'd like to start by extending my heartfelt congratulations to everyone here, and I do mean everyone. To the graduates of the class of 2024, of course, this is your day. But also to everyone here, parents, friends, professors, staff, who worked hard to make the promise of your college education into a reality. It takes a village to raise a child, and it takes a college or university to raise a graduate. So congratulations to all of you for a job well done. And to my fellow honorary degree awardees, this is your day too, and I'm honored to share it with you. So this is what in my tradition we call a Shehekianu moment, a moment when we pause to appreciate the fact that we have come to this point in time, this place in the world, this moment of success and happiness. Shehekianu literally means we are alive, and moments like this are worth savoring and remembering. So while I am not a comedian, and I will try not to be boring, in the hopes that you may remember some of my comments. So in this moment of joy and happiness, I'd like to talk about something slightly difficult, the problem of conflict and contradiction. We all know, and to some degree we understand in our hearts, that joy and sadness can reside in the same place, even at the same time. Today, you graduates are happy to be graduating, but probably also sad to be leaving friends. You may be excited about what comes next, but probably also anxious. This sort of contradiction, the bittersweet quality of many of life's milestones, is obvious. Less obvious is how we manage the conflict and contradictions of everyday life. As we gather here today to celebrate your accomplishments, we gather against a backdrop of tremendous tension in our world, our country, and even in our academic communities. We feel divided in ways that most of us who are old enough to remember would say we have not felt for 60 years. So what do we do with this contradiction? Is it fair to celebrate, to be joyous, when others are suffering? Many of us felt this way during COVID. I know I did. For me, COVID was an oddly precious time. With my husband in the next room, our adult daughter down the hall, my dog at my feet, and two cats that our daughter brought home from Tennessee, I loved working at home. It was a relief to travel less, to talk less, and to think and write more. Yet my contentment sat alongside heartsick, knowing that my students were losing an important part of their college experience, and that everywhere, people were suffering, struggling, and dying. Or consider this. We are at Bard College, home of the Hannah Arendt Center, the place where Arendt found an intellectual home after the horrors of the Holocaust and the devastating destruction of World War II. World War II destroyed tens of millions of lives, thousands of cities, and countless dreams. Arendt was one of the country's great witnesses to this destruction, reified in the trial of the Nazi Adolf Eichmann. More cogently than almost any other thinker, she confronted the question of how evil comes to dwell in our midst. She coined the term, the banality of evil, to describe the ways in which extreme evil can insinuate itself into daily life and be perpetuated by people who in other respects seem ordinary. Evil, Arendt made us see, rarely announces itself. More often, it creeps up upon us. And yet, and yet, Arendt, one of the Nazi's most, sorry, one of the century's most acute observers of Nazis, was the student and lover of the Nazi Martin Heidegger. Martin Heidegger was a Nazi, 
He was a member of the Nazi party. His private notebooks contain numerous unequivocally anti-Semitic comments. He subscribed to a belief in heroic violence. In the words of one recent commentator, Heidegger's outflick, outlook quote reflects a clear and deep-seated commitment to the worldview of Nazism. Yet, at the same time, Heidegger was one of the most influential philosophers of the 20th century. Many concepts that we take for granted today, such as the concept of situated knowledge, a concept that many people who embrace would consider themselves progressives, have their origins in part in his work. Martin Heidegger was a great philosopher and a great fascist. That's a hard thing to get your head around. We want our great thinkers to be great people. We want our heroes to be entirely good and our villains to be entirely bad. But often they are not. Good people sometimes do bad things. And bad people sometimes do good things. After all, Hitler was a vegetarian, something my students are always really, really upset about. <laughs> Nazi scientists also pioneered our understanding and documenting the hazards of tobacco use. Or consider John Locke, a man who owned stock in slave trading companies. Locke justified the appropriation of Native American lands on the grounds that Native people who did not farm could not be said to own the land on which they lived. Property rights, he believed, arose from labor of a particular sort that was legible to Europeans like himself. As the great philosopher Charles Mills wrote, Locke's social contract, quote, could be regarded as founded on an exclusionary intra-white racial contract that denies equal moral, legal, and political standing to people of color. People are contradictory. That is a fact, as surely as the claim that the Earth is an oblate spheroid or that E equals mc squared. In fact, the foundations of modern science, modern physics, rest on a contradiction. Modern physics tells us that light is neither a wave nor a particle, but in some ways neither and both. Physics tells us that in certain circumstances, Schrodinger's cat is both dead and alive. Bard is proud of its status as a liberal arts college, and rightly so. But liberalism has its own well-known contradictions, or at least we could call them tensions, such as the oft remark tension between our cultivation of expert knowledge and our commitment to democratic decision-making. It's an instinct for many of us to want to resolve these contradictions, to conclude that Heidegger must be either a great thinker or a fascist, because how could he be both? Or to say that Locke is a racist cannot be an inspiration to us today. To insist that Schrodinger's cat must be either alive or dead, and if you don't like cats, preferably dead. <laughs> Knowing that Heidegger was a Nazi, we could cancel him. We could decide that his ideas no longer merit consideration. We could expunge him from our philosophy classes. But to do so would be to deny the course of history, to deny the impact his ideas have had for better or worse. And the same goes for John Locke. Locke's ideas on governance and natural rights were so central to Thomas Jefferson and the framers of the US Constitution that we would be hard pressed to understand the creation of this country, again, for better or worse, without understanding Locke. So what I'd like to suggest today is that not resolving contradiction is central to intellectual life and to the core mission of great liberal arts colleges like Bard. The answer to many problems is indeed both and. And many conflicts arise in part because we insist there must be an answer. We succumb to the fallacy of the excluded middle. It's either capitalism or communism. It's either individual rights or the common good. It's either censorship or free speech absolutism. John Stuart Mill is another great thinker whose legacy is mixed, but there is one point upon which I think he was absolutely right. To paraphrase just slightly, Mill said that in many conflicts, both sides are right in what they affirm and wrong in what they deny. It seems to me that Mill's idea is central to what we, 
as intellectual communities need to keep up front and center. That it's rare for any one thinker or any one position in a debate to be entirely right and the others entirely wrong. We all prioritize the aspects of a problem that seem most salient to us. Had we come from a different place or had different life experiences, we would very likely view the matter differently. And down the road in a few years, a few months, or even a few weeks, we may view the matter differently still. This is one of the central arguments for diversity, that people see things differently based on their backgrounds and life experiences. It is the moral of the old fable of the blind men and the elephant, as well as the great Kurosawa film, Rashomon, that we all see only partially. And for this reason, because vision and perspective is always partial, as isolated individuals, we never, apprehend, we never apprehend the whole truth. But when we bring diverse perspectives communities, sorry, when we bring diverse perspectives together in communities like this, it doesn't guarantee that we find the truth, but it does make us more likely to see and appreciate the whole truth. If we think for a moment about the word university, it's immediately obvious that its root is the same as universal and universe. While the universities of medieval Europe were not, of course, universal, they did seek to comprehensively cover the major areas of learning recognized at the time, the trivium, grammar, logic, and rhetoric, and the quadrivium, arithmetic, geometry, music, and astronomy. Today, universities and liberal arts colleges cover far more ground than those seven subjects. At Bard, students are offered 35 different degree programs, as well as numerous interdivisional programs and concentrations. Why do we have so many different degrees, so many different things for students to study? The obvious answer is that, because the world is complicated and contradictory, we need to look at it from many angles. To meet people's needs and solve the world's problems, we need to embrace a wide range of disciplines, approaches, methodologies, and perspectives. All these different disciplines, most of which did not exist 1,000 years ago, are a response to the recognition that we need many ways of thinking. As members of a living and learning community, it is our job to explore ideas and, where necessary, do the hard work of explaining why certain ideas are false, harmful, or otherwise problematic. It is not our job to suppress bad ideas, but to expose them as bad. And especially in these times when sometimes it seems that everyone is yelling at each other, to find the capacity to listen, and where appropriate, just be quiet. Not everything that can be said should be said. Civility, decency, and just plain kindness sometimes require us to hold our tongues. Sometimes the right answer in the face of a problem is not to do something, but just to stand there, to wait, to watch, and to listen. We've heard a lot in recent months about free speech. We've heard a lot less about listening. Indeed, we don't even have an equivalent turn of speech, an equivalent phrase, Free listening doesn't even make syntactic sense. But what use is free speech if no one is listening? So I'd like to close my remarks with the thought that in this difficult moment, a key role that we can play at colleges and universities as graduates going out into the world is to find ways to create opportunities to listen as well as to speak, to watch as well as to act. Because one way to help resolve contradictions, to find what is right in divergent views, is by listening, really listening. The world needs both speaking and listening. If no one spoke, there would be nothing to listen to. But if no one listens, then there isn't much point in speaking. So thank you for listening to me today. And once again, congratulations to the class of 2024.